Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, webinar today on Lagoon Pests. Um, I'm Patrick Hill, uh, one of the founders here at Triple Point. Uh, I've been working with Lagoons for uh, about 16 years. I've uh, presented at uh, various conferences, both on the state level and at WEFTEC, uh, and probably work with hundreds of Lagoon systems, uh, mainly in working on upgrade solutions. Um, so today we're, we're going to talk about um, common lagoon pro pests and problems um, and their solutions. We actually did a poll to our Facebook group um, to see what kind of lagoon pests or things that people wanted before we created this presentation. And we, these are the ones we came up with, uh, that the group came up with, snails, red worms, and midge flies, muskrats, geese, and duckweed. Um, for those who aren't part of our Facebook group, I'll put a little plug in for the Facebook group here. Uh, it's a great, uh, it's called the Lagoons Do It Better Facebook group. You can access it via our website or you can just search on Facebook. Uh, there's over 700 operators in that group right now. And it's just a bunch of people that, you know, people put questions up there and operators help out operators. It's a, it's quite a, quite a good community and good resource if you need extra help with Lagoons. So this is, um, this is part of our master class series, which we started doing about a year ago. Uh, there are six key modules in the master class series. There's lagoon process, hydraulics, biosolids, algae, nutrients, data analysis, and troubleshooting. Uh, and we're in the lagoon process section. We actually uh, recorded three webinars in the spring, and this will be the third webinar here at the end of the year. And we'll do some more webinars next spring, but we'll be, I think we're pretty close to being done with the lagoon process section. And we'll move on to hydraulics and biosolids and algae and then nutrients, et cetera. So uh, we hope one day to put all these up on our online platform. And if you need any CU or PDH credits, you can get them. And then uh, maybe you'll get certified as a certified lagoon master uh, at the end of this. So for those who don't know Triple Point, um, we are a company that focuses exclusively on lagoon systems. Um, and, you know, we've done over the last 16 years about 200 lagoon upgrades. Um, and so during that, that process of doing all those upgrades, we've, we've developed this proven process, what we call the Lagoon Stupid Better Process, um, that, that is designed to give you consistent results, right? We, we implement this over and over and over again at different sites. We prove and tweak and, and we get the right results out of it. So it starts with diagnosing lagoon problem. What's your problem? What are your objectives? What are your core issues at the plant? Whether you're trying to meet a permit, a new permit requirement, or you're trying to replace old infrastructure, or old iteration system, for example, and improve efficiency, or whether you're trying to expand capacity, we want to take the time to gather the information we need in order to understand what that problem is. Then we move into the phase of tailoring, and this is part of our tailoring process where we take our solution, our knowledge, our understanding, and help to work with you, the lagoon owner, or the operator, or the engineer, to develop a solution that works best for the system. And that's evaluating alternatives, reviewing, discussing, and refining and creating detail uh, plans and specifications. And then finally, we follow through with help in the implementation, the commissioning, and ultimately the long run operation of the system. And we stand behind every system we do. We call it our, we say we do a guarantee. We will do what it takes to make sure the system's going to work. And if it's not working, we'll come out and fix it. Um, so, you know, we do this, we have this process. So what? Well, the so what is, you know, if you have a lagoon upgrade and you need to do because you got an old system again, or you have to increase capacity or have to meet a new limit, you know, um, you really got to give that system open heart surgery. And if you personally need the open heart surgery, would you go to a general practitioner, somebody who does all manner of different types of uh, surgery or help with people, or would you go to a specialist? And you go to a specialist because they know what they're doing. They have a proven process. They do, this is all they do. It's all they focus on and they do it in day in, day out. And that's us at Triple Point. So that's my one and only plug in this presentation. Um, if you do need help on anything, any project you're working on Lagoon related, we are more than happy to be of assistance. 
So lagoon pests. Um, so we're going to talk about snails, red worms and midge flies, muskrats, geese, and duckweed in this presentation. We're going to talk about why each of these things are a problem. And then we're going to talk about what the solutions are for these kinds of things. Before I get into the first snails uh, one, I just want to share this funny story. So this system here in Iowa is um, one of our, our sort of flagship nitrox systems. Um, it's uh, city of DeSoto right outside of Des Moines. And I was talking to the operator, Dan Van Langen, who's a good friend of mine. And he was telling me how uh, one day they're going doing the rounds, they get out to the lagoon and all of a sudden they just see tons of decapitated fish just laying around the lagoon. And they're just like, they, 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 they thought the apocalypse was upon them. You know, it was just so odd. It didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. And so they started asking around, you know, talk to rural water, talk to the DNR, like what's going on here? Why did this happen? And it turns out somebody at the DNR said that they'd seen this before where river otter had come up to the lagoon, hunted all the fish, bit off its heads, and then dropped them on the berm and went right back into the, into the, into the river right next to the DeSoto. And they hadn't seen it before at DeSoto, but they'd seen it at the other facilities. So this, you know, sick sadistic river otter uh, had come up and uh, just went wild and didn't seem to even really want to eat the uh, the fish. So it, it's pretty crazy, an interesting example. I mean, an unusual example. I don't think I've seen this before. This of uh, of a lagoon pest, but these are the types of problems that uh, that that occur, you know, and that's what these pests are, are really all about. So pouch snails. Um, so, so, you know, say hello to my little friend, uh, except it's really not your friend. Um, pouch snails are a common nuisance uh, in wastewater uh, facilities. Uh, they happen in activated sludge, in, um, you know, different types of processes, including lagoons. And, you know, they primarily feed, uh, they're, they're small, these items, and they, and they, they, they primarily feed off organic material, including algae, biomass, and ammonia oxide and bacteria. Um, and they want to grow in conditions where they have food, high oxygen, and, and relatively calm and quiescent, co co quiescent conditions. Um, and typically, they're laying their larvae on a substrate. Um, so they, they can find something smooth like a uh, you know the wall of a clarifier or the or the or, you know any kind of concrete surface that's smooth or or a plastic surface that's smooth if you have fixed media they're going to lay that that substrate on there that's going to be their eggs and they're going to reproduce from there uh, in this quiet environment with oxygen quiescent conditions and good organic food load they can eat so what are the problems well Part of the problem is, um, it, you know, if you Google, for example, um, uh, you know, pouch snails wastewater, you'll find a lot of um, stories about pouch snails uh, growing in trickling filters because trickling filters have that uh, media that's, you know, it's basically a sheet type of media where they have perfect environment to grow their substrate, lots of oxygen, there's organic material on the media itself. And the problem you can run into is they'll actually eat ammonia metabolizing bacteria. Um, and so they'll actually eat your nitrifiers. Um, and they'll eat sludge and they'll eat different things. And sometimes that's eating your bugs. And then if they eat your bugs, then obviously you don't do a great job uh, treating for what you're trying to treat for. Um, they can also build up in effluent structures. I got an example of this in a minute uh, where uh, they can clog pipes or clog a B-notch weir or something like that. Um, and if you have filters or some other downstream system, they can really damage it. They can damage the filter media. Uh, anything downstream where these things are, they can really build up in a really dense mass, like you can see here in this picture, can be a real problem. So this shows you a, a filter media cartridge. Uh, this is an inside out filter type that one of our customers had. and they just grew in that filter. They were laying their eggs on that filter media. They were proliferating on that thing. Obviously, that's a 20 micron filter material that is not going to let pouch snails through it. 
shouldn't, it shouldn't, it's not supposed to. And so it could be a real mess and nightmare and cause a lot of damage. In that okay. case, it really did. So why? Well, within lagoon systems, um, some of the root causes are if you have a lot of algae, um, they like to feed on that algae. Uh, that algae also will increase the DO, which gives them a better environment to be in. They also feed on sludge. Um, oftentimes, and this is true of redworms that we'll talk about soon, but it's true of, of these pouch snails too, is, you know, um, if you've got a lot of sludge, you know, pouch snails can be an indication that you've got too much. Um, and in some cases, you know, for example, in clarifiers, um, these can be a problem because they can go down, eat the sludge, and then they can actually reduce the amount of RAS that's available to, to recirculate back into an aeration basin. So it's definitely something you got to be concerned about. Um, quiescent downstream structures are good places for them to be. Anywhere they can lay their eggs is a substrate like a filter like this. And if you're not paying attention and you're not trying to control them, they will, they can proliferate pretty quickly. So, solutions. Well, one thing I would say is, you know, you really do, within a lagoon, really want to inspect your downstream structures because eventually they'll flow their way down to some kind of effluent structure. So this shows you one of our nitrox systems in Missouri. This is actually one of our first. Um, the water flows from the lagoon through these two reactor cells there, the two big concrete cells, and then flows from there into a V-notch weir. And the V-notch weir basically controls um, the flow uh, and measures the flow right there at that structure. And one day the operator called me and he's like, hey, guess what I found on the V-notch weir? And he sent me this picture, right? Just tons of these ucky, gucky snails that built up in this V-notch weir structure. And it just was the perfect environment. Really high DO, maybe some algae passing through there. They got some food, they got DO, they got concrete to lay their substrate on. They're loving it. And he ended up removing, um, you know, two wheelbarrows full of these things. So obviously going forward, He's going to keep an eye on that structure because he knows that can happen. And hopefully, if he catches these things after, you know, if they start to proliferate, he can remove them and then ultimately spray those surfaces with a 3% hypo solution, which will just kill the larvae. Um, that's sort of like a translucent slime uh, for these, they're essentially the eggs for these snails and prevent that from happening again. The other thing is, Again, they can be, because they feed on algae, um, it can be an indication that you have a lot of algae and that you, maybe you should think about trying to control the algae. Uh, now, there are a number of ways to do this. Um, Dr. Lindell Rich, who's kind of famous in the lagoon world, um, did this study where he looked at the effect of aeration on algae growth, uh, chlorophyll levels, which is an indicator of algae growth. And he came up with this graph here kind of showing the sort of watts per meters cubed of water um, that you would need in order to kind of successfully control algae. Um, so you could certainly add aeration to your lagoons. Aeration, not a slam dunk solution to an algae problem, uh, but certainly it's something that helps. Um, and so that's one thing you can look at. The other thing with algae is you can look at covering a lagoon and oftentimes if you, uh, you don't necessarily have to cover all of your lagoons, you can cover just your final polishing cell in many cases, uh, such as this small shell here. And I have a whole presentation on algae that we'll do. I think we have a whole section of the mass class on algae. So I'll get more into this. But basically, if you're limiting the sunlight that the algae has to in order to photosynthesize, you're going to limit the algae growth. Um, and that can, can really be a good thing. Now, if you want extra points, you can do aeration plus shading or plus a cover. Uh, and that really helps to knock out your algae. So this study here was done on a lake um, and they basically had three uh, sections of the lake. They had one section with uh, where they did nothing to it. They had one confined section where they put just a cover on and then they had one that had cover plus aeration. And you can see here the drop in chlorophyll or the TSS in this case, but we converted it from chlorophyll for uh, the number of days that these things were in the cover. So this, the, um, the line here 
was um, the yellow line is for the control. This is the, the thing they did nothing on. The gray line is for the cover, just cover. Uh, and then the orange line is for the cover plus aeration. And you can see that with the cover, you probably need about five days or so of, of cover uh, where the water sits there in order to get a decent amount of, uh, of algae removal uh, reduction. And if you put cover and aeration, you could take that down to about three days. So this can be a good solution uh, if you're really uh, interested in getting after algae, but it's just one way to prevent pouch nails. Other ways to control algae, uh, you, can, uh, you can manage it with the application of chemicals. Uh, and you know, copper sulfate is a common chemical used for algae uh, control. Basically, the way it works is that it will raise the toxicity level in the water such that the algae cannot grow. Um, but the issue I see with that is that you know, you've got water constantly coming in. So if you do treat with copper sulfate, water, eventually that water will be diluted and diluted and diluted until non, till, till there's low enough level of toxicity that algae will regrow. And the problem you get with algae is similar to duckweed, which I'll talk about later, which is once it dies, it sinks to the bottom and it carries with it all the nutrients that are sequestered in the cell wall of the algae. And so if you are doing this constant cycle of killing, letting it sink, regrowing, killing, letting it sink, regrow, you are basically compounding the amount of nutrients that are in your lagoon uh, that will make the algae blooms worse and worse over time. And so if you are going to use a copper sulfate top product, it's also good to follow it up with a more of an, a bacterial-based enzyme type product that can help break down the dead algae. Uh, once you kill it, uh, in order to try and reduce that, that sort of buildup of nutrient within the lagoon system. So sludge. So like I said, they also feed on sludge. And what happens with sludge, as you can see here in this picture, is that um, this is what we call popping sludge. And what really this is, is that once you get enough sludge buildup on the bottom of your lagoon, um, it'll start to break down anaerobically which produces hydrogen sulfide. Those little hydrogen sulfide bubbles start to build up underneath some of the sludge mats on the bottom. And eventually, once you get enough of that hydrogen sulfide, it'll float the sludge to the surface. It literally just acts like a, a ballast, or not a ballast, but a, a flotation uh, device uh, uh, in order to, to have a top of the lagoon. So I actually went on this lagoon, it was pretty nasty with the amount of popping sludge. This is an extreme example. But it, it kind of shows you, you know, that if you can, if you are seeing popping sludge like this on your lagoon, it's usually an indicator that you have too much sludge. Um, or it, maybe it's an indicator that you don't have enough aeration in your basin as well. Um, and so if you can kind of mitigate that either by looking at ways to break down the sludge, which I'll talk more detail about in a minute, or, or actually adoration, so you really have anaerobic conditions that can kind of help break down some of the sludge. So first step to doing that is really measuring how much sludge you have. And we have a whole section of the masterclass on biosol, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much. But you know, doing sludge surveying can be really helpful. Uh, this shows you kind of one example of a sludge survey that we did. Uh, actually, Steve Harris did this uh, at a plant in Arizona where he went around and measured the sludge depth uh, across the lagoon at you know nine nine points per lagoon for that size of lagoon, but it could be 20 points or 25 points depending on how big your lagoons are. And so when you do these measurements and you kind of find that you've got over about two feet of sludge and two feet being kind of the operative uh, sludge storage design for a lagoon system, you need to think about planning to remove sludge at that point. Um, because it gets to the point where sludge causes a lot of problems, not just pouch snails, just a lot of problems uh, in a lagoon system. Uh, I'd say, I always say it's it's one of the Achilles skills of a lagoon system is sludge, right? I mean, it's, you, um, you, you don't have to do it very often. You don't have to remove sludge. You don't have to manage sludge every single day, not like a mechanical plant, which is a tremendous advantage. But at some point, 
you've got to go in there 25, 30 years later, and you've got to clean the slush off the bottom because if you don't, it leads to all sorts of problems, uh, pouch snails included, but all sorts of problems within your lagoon system. So one way to manage sludge is to try to break it down in situ, in place. Uh, I mentioned aeration before. I'll just give you a little case study here. Uh, this was actually a oil refining plant that we uh, worked with. Uh, they didn't they don't do hydrocarbon oil. They did cooking oil, so peanut oil, things like that that you would use to to deep fry your turkey at Thanksgiving. And um, you know they had this big lagoon, 16 feet deep, with these surface aerators on it, pounding away. And the issue with the surface aerators is often they're really not able to mix the entire volume of the lagoon. They can maybe mix the first five feet of water, but they're not going to mix the total 16 feet of water that this lagoon had. And so they came to us and they're like, hey, can we drop in some of your aerators to see uh, see what the effect is, is going to be on the slush? So we said, sure. So our aerator sits on the bottom. This is a CFD model showing you kind of how it works. And it bubbles from the bottom to the top. And what it does is it creates mixing and adds oxygen into the water. And specifically trying to, to to mix that sludge so that we can actually get some removal of that sludge just by biological degradation of it. So we started out, first thing we did, we did a sludge survey. Uh, we went out, we took all these different points on the lagoon, we measured uh, sludge depth. We also took core samples to see what the volatility of the sludge was, which basically means like how much of this sludge is inorganic or sand and grit and stuff we can't break down and how much of this sludge is organic material that we can break down um and and, and this is you know after we did a couple of different sludge surveys after putting the system in we did the initial one which is the blue here uh at the back of this graph that was the initial sludge amounts across the basin on december 5th 2017 then we came back on february 18th and then came back on november 18th uh, 2018 to see what happened. Overall, we were able to reduce the amount of sludge by 44.44%. Uh, uh, so really good reduction of sludge in place without necessarily having to get in there and dredge. Customer was very happy. We reduced the sludge. We increased the volume of the lagoon, which, you know, when you think about sludge, you often don't think about the fact that it, it takes up volume and that means you have less water volume of water to treat. There's more of that volume of water is just taken up by sludge. So when you reduce sludge, you also get more volume, which then helps improve your overall treatment time. Um, and ultimately, these they save money on dredging costs. So lots of ways to manage sludge. So just a few examples. I would say um, we're going to do more specific uh, classes on biosolids, which we'll talk about how to measure sludge, how to reduce it, you know, if you're dredging, what are the best practices there, and so on and so forth. But this is just one example of where this uh, was able to be put in place, and, and this could help with a snail situation. Last thing I'll say on snails, um, I thought of this. This is a Y strainer, uh, commonly used in drinking water systems or well water systems, and basically the water flows through the strainer, and it flows through basically a mesh basket that's kind of coming down on the Y. And that catches anything larger than whatever the micron rating of that, that uh, strainer is, which is usually pretty big, big enough to allow most things through, but not big enough to allow the snails through. And if you put this in line, let's say you're, you're having issues with a downstream structure, if you put this in line flowing to that downstream structure, it can catch some of that stuff and potentially, you know, uh, avoid some of the snail issues. You can flush it. Uh, install a, val a valve down here at the bottom and flush it when you need to, things like that. So something to consider, pretty cheap and inexpensive way to do it relative to putting a cover on the lagoon or removing sludge, but uh, certainly something to look at. So red worms and midge flies. So um, midge flies are, you know, kind of look like mosquitoes, but they don't bite, which is probably the only good thing about them in terms of um, in a lagoon system, uh, they really can be a major, major nuisance. Um, so I had a, a customer that uh, had a filter building 
and they got a bad case of Michelin's. And it was horrendous. You walked in that building, they were all over the place, swarming all over the place. You had to wear a mask, you had to wear safety glasses. It was just a complete nightmare um, and, uh, and not a very pleasant thing. Um, and so uh, they, they start off as larvae, or people call them red worms, but really they're, they're more like the Mischlizes larvae. They feed on organics. Uh, they don't bite, but they can create an allergic reaction. Um, so the way they they work and they thrive is that you know you, you, the male and the female mate, and then the female drops the eggs. It sinks down to the bottom, and oftentimes it'll lodge itself in sludge. Uh, the the red worms. It's typically, when you see them, and I'll show you a video here in a minute, you see them just like swimming around in sludge. They're kind of like they call them red worms because they're they're worms in the sense that they like to kind of be in the dirt, uh, but in this case, the sludge, because they actually eat the sludge, is their food source, but really they're larvae. Um, they can lay up, one female can lay up to 3,000 eggs. Um, they like the warmer conditions. Um, and once they hatch, they come to the surface, they fly and they swirl. So this video here kind of shows you um, I actually was at this plant in, um, in Georgia and I saw this like right at the back of the plant, they just had this like kind of sludge pile and I saw the, all the red worms in it. I'm like, well, I gotta get a video of that. And it's not great. You can't see it too well, but, but it shows you the, uh, the red worms kind of the wet that they look like they're obviously red and they're kind of swing. They're kind of like wiggling around in this sludge pile and it's pretty, pretty nasty stuff actually. <laughs> Um, but they, they do feed on the sludge and, and they're similar to the snails. It can be problematic. I mean, you're like, great, they feed on the sludge, but they also eat some of the bugs that are in that sludge. And again, if they're growing on, um, similar to if they're, they can eat some of your nitrifiers, they can remove some of that biomass that you might not necessarily want to remove, uh, from your lagoon system. Um, and so, um, it's generally not preferred to have them. And the flies themselves are just such a nuisance when you're around the lagoon as well, which also makes them uh, not the best things to have. It can be an indication of high sludge levels, uh, which lead to high lagoon odors, uh, high nutrient loads. So like if you're getting, at the end of the day, if you're getting, um, if you're getting a lot of ammonia flow out of your affluent or your summer is not going as well from an ammonia removal standpoint, it might be, it might be red worms that are eating your sludge or eating your nitrifiers, just like the snails. Um, so not a good, not a good thing. So what are the solutions? Well, you know, some more practical solutions are to, if you have a, a you know, a, a lamp at your plant, you know, they're very attracted to light. So at nighttime, for example, if you have a, a you know um, a light post right there, it'll just they'll just swarm on that, and they're really attracted to that light. Um, and so turning that off sort of dissuades them, creates a less hospitable environment. They'll go, they might fly somewhere else uh, to get some light. Um, like I said, you could treat and reduce sludge with all the reason, all the ways we kind of talked about earlier. To an extent, um, you can introduce natural predators. Lagoons, um, you know, there's the jambusa fish, or they call it the mosquito fish, uh, which will actually eat the red worms uh, and the uh, and the midge flies as they land on the water. Um, now, I'm not a huge fan of fish uh, in water uh, to do these kinds of things, although it sounds like a great solution, sounds like a cheap solution. What I found is that they grow so big to the point where um, you know, they're pooping, they're eating and pooping and they can build up the sludge blanket that way and eventually they die. And when they die, it's not a good situation in, in many cases. So I'm not a huge fan of putting fish in lagoons personally. I think they do have some benefits, but I think the, the disadvantages outweigh the benefits. There are chemical solutions. So this shows you a couple. Uh, when I had my, when our customer had a midge fly issue, this is what they use, the Aquabact, is a kind of a chemical product which helps to basically kill the uh, the red worms and the bug juice is an enzymatic product which helps to break down the dead uh, the dead um, uh, red worms once they're 
they're there. And our customer was able to use this stuff and actually eventually they, they get rid of all the niche lights. Uh, took them two or three months, but they got rid of them. So muskrats. Um, muskrats, you know, uh, I've heard a thousand stories about muskrats and lagoons, uh, especially in the Midwest. Uh, you know, they're a cute, furry little creature uh, like this, almost kind of look like a bee for a great extent. Um, they can be a nuisance. Uh, they do, the big thing with lagoons is that they'll destroy your berm. Um, and oftentimes, you know, when you get your DNR inspection, they all be looking for berm damage from muskrats and they, they can create leaks in the berm, they can cause total berm failure, uh, really not a good thing. The other thing we see is that they tend to chew through wires. Uh, so I can't tell you how many times I've heard of a muskrat chewing through a transducer wire, you know, at a lift station, right? We've all heard and seen that. They just kind of like that rubbery wire texture. Um, they are omnivores, they do eat plants, uh, some amphibians, like uh, turtles and small fish, but largely in the new context, complete nuisance. So what can you do with muskrats? Well, uh, one thing you can do is you can put riprap around the lagoon, um, which is basically just rock. Riprap is, it is kind of expensive to put in, but it also has the benefit of uh, limiting the amount of erosion at the surface of the lagoon that happens. It can basically eliminate erosion uh, due to wave action on the lagoons, which is kind of nice because uh, a lot of lagoons have erosion issues, especially ones that are have vibration in the basin that creates these little waves that eventually just erode and erode and erode the banks. Um, other solutions I've heard of, you can put a one or two inch wire placed along the edge of the water, right where the water meets the edge of the lagoon. And it, it discourages the muskrats from burrowing uh, into the burr. You can hire a trapper uh, is one thing. Uh, they'll come out and trap them. Now they may come back, but certainly you can put traps out there and get the muskrats out of there. Uh, one kind of innovative solution I heard of was the city of Perryville. So if you Google Perryville muskrats, uh, you'll see what they did was they decided to allow the townspeople to come onto the site and actually shoot the muskrats. Uh, so this became a, uh, a little bit of a sport in Perryville. I'm not sure if they ever fully got rid of the muskrats, but uh, some people had some fun. Uh, shooting muskrats at a wastewater lagoon. Uh, part of that article, which was really interesting, was they uh, they recommended a, a muskrat stew, uh, which uh, apparently is, is pretty good. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a little gamey for some, but uh, you could certainly do it. And apparently their pelts are really, really warm. Uh, final option here, just you can poison them. Again, once they're dead, you got to remove them. Um, but they are just kind of one of those pesky looking nuisances. And you got to do what you can to kind of get rid of them uh, at the end of the day. So geese, I can't tell you how many lagoons I've been to and seen geese. They think it's a lake. They don't think it's a wastewater treatment system and they don't frankly do not care. So, um, you know, geese, um, they do tend to love the aeration. I've seen that a bunch too, where they're swimming around on there and they think like the aeration is kind of a bubble bath with, uh, I mean, at least with diffused aeration. Um, the problem you run into with geese is like they can be aggressive. So it's all this picture. I'm not sure how this guy got on the ground because of a goose uh, playing on a golf course, but uh, it's a very dramatic picture. So I decided to include it in this presentation, but. Uh, they can be, you don't really want to mess with geese too much. They can be a little aggressive and, and go after you, uh, either one or in groups. Um, so they can uh, not necessarily want something you want to trifle with. Um, the other thing you see with geese is that they, they, they poop a lot, right? So it's, you know, one goose poops about 0.72 pounds a day, which doesn't sound like uh, a lot, but when they're doing it 28 times a day, uh, that's 100 geese is seven pounds per day, a thousand geese is 70 pounds per day, and that poop is actually pretty rich in phosphorus and could potentially raise the overall phosphorus levels uh, in your wastewater, which if you do have a limit for phosphorus, could be problematic. Phosphorus also is one of the primary drivers of algae growth. 
So if you get a lot of geese and they're pooping and a lot of that poop contains phosphorus, which it does, it will make your algae blooms a little bit worse. Uh, so certainly not something that you would like. Uh, I saw this uh, online. Uh, somebody was having a little fun with this one. Goose poop. Uh, it is a sweet and slightly spicy pepper sauce. Um, so oh, you can Google that one if you're interested in buying some goose poop. I'm not sure if it looks kind of like goose poop, but I'm not sure I would eat it because I would be disgusted by the association with goose poop. Um, but have at it. Okay, solutions. So um, there are a number of solutions here. One thing is, you know, a dog. Dogs like to chase geese. Uh, the problem with that oftentimes is that, you know, a dog won't necessarily swim in the water to get after geese. Um, and so that may not work out as well as we might anticipate. The Indiana DNR has a, um, has a whole paper on uh, goose, you know, a way to, uh, to control for geese if you have too many geese. I'm going to put it in the links at the back of this presentation here that you can read out on it. One of the things that they uh, recommended was actually destroying the eggs. And you can pick them up and shake them, or you can uh, rub them in oil, and that will stop them from hatching. Uh, just be really careful not to do this when the mom's around uh, because uh, they will come and attack you. The sec third thing you can do is you can harass them. You know, if you get out there, uh, my mom uh, back in the day was a big fan of the uh, cat gun. And she used to get so frustrated with the geese that uh, I swear if I had swapped out the cat gun for an Uzi, she would have totally mowed all those geese down uh, in, her, in her rage at seeing these geese because she was so frustrated to what she what they were doing with the lawn and, and in the garden and so on. So um, you can definitely harass them. They harass us, so we might as well harass them. Um, there are chemical repellents you can buy. And if you don't have too big of a lagoon, you can string wires across the surface of the lagoon itself and it will, it will deter the geese from landing uh, on your lagoon. Uh, sometimes that's not super practical uh, for lagoons that are really big. But uh, if you got a smaller lagoon, they tend to like to hang out in and putting wires across the surface, just you know, stringing them across and keeping them a little bit tensioned can certainly be something that helps to dissipate the geese. The next option I found, which I thought was hilarious, uh, I'm gonna let the video speak for itself on this one because uh, this is this is brilliant. And this ha happens to come from uh, my hometown here at Denver. Hold on. I think the sound's not working on that. Let's go. Okay, that does not seem to be working from a sound standpoint. Um, I apologize for that. But um, the general throughput here is this, this goosenator thing. It has a remote control and you can fly it around and it'll go on water, it'll go on grass, and it just basically scares the geese away, which I thought was kind of fun. Uh, I'll also put that in the link at the back of the presentation. If you're out there, you want to have a little bit of fun, you want to chase some geese around, you can maybe spend a little comic relief an hour or two of your day uh, or not, maybe less than that, maybe just uh, 15, 30 minutes of your day uh, when the geese are out there during migration season. That sounds like a good plan to me. So duckweed. Um, this is also came up on the list as a kind of a pond pest, a pond nuisance. Um, I would say, um, you know, duckweed is basically, it's not algae people do often com 
to use it with algae, but it's a leafy aquatic plant found worldwide. It spreads uh, through the movement of animals. So a duck, I think they call it duckweed because a duck flies from one pond, it kind of gets caught on their fur, then lands in another pond, and that's how they transport duckweed from one pond to the other. It proliferates very quickly in the right conditions. It can double its biomass in two days. It can cover an entire acre within 45 days. And it likes quiescent, uh, slow moving water where nutrients, um, where there's lots of nutrients that can be used. It still uses sort of that nitrogen and phosphorus uh, type of nutrients in order to grow. That's one of the key ingredients it needs. And if it gets a lot of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, it's gonna grow, it's, it's a food source. So um, I think, you know, with duckweed, it, you know, it, it can become, one of the biggest problems with duckweed is it, it, it can be an, a nutrient sink uh, within the water. So it's similar to, to algae and that when it grows, it actually sucks up the nitrogen and phosphorus that's in the water. And then if you go out there and you kill it with chemicals, for example, or you wait till the winter time and it dies off, it'll just die off naturally, it'll sink down to the bottom and then that'll become part of your sludge blanket. So it keeps all those nutrients in and then it regrows again the next summer. So it basically prevents those nutrients from flowing out of your plant. And preventing, by preventing those nutrients from flowing out of your plant, it's causing a continual buildup of nutrients over time, uh, which is ultimately not great uh, for the system. It can lead to more duckweed or in some cases, some years it'll switch over to algae and that's when it becomes a real, a real, real problem. Now there was a time at where there was sort of this dream of duckweed, right? Like duckweed, you're saying, well, look, it sucks up these nutrients, it sucks up nitrogen, it sucks up phosphorus, that's great. What if we can then harvest the duckweed out of the water in order to remove those nutrients from the water? So this lagoon here is actually a lagoon we worked on in Louisiana where they had all these little uh, square structures you can see um, where they're basically algae duckweed, sorry, duckweed growing pods and they would prevent the, a duckweed from blowing on one side of the lagoon or whatever, and they would just stick in there and it would create this ideal environment. And then they would go in and harvest the duckweed. And by harvesting the duckweed, they harvest the nutrients out of the pond. And then you could potentially use that duckweed for uh, as a fertilizer or as a feed source or, or so on. There's a couple of problems with this approach, I think, from a harvesting duckweed standpoint. And this is why it probably does not use really Number one is duckweed doesn't grow as fast in the wintertime. And if you're up north, obviously, your lagoons are gonna be frozen in the wintertime, so you're not growing any duckweed. You're not removing any nutrients then. Two, there's, it's pretty labor intensive to remove the duckweed. Uh, when it's set up in these grids like this, they had a duckweed harvesting machine, but you know it's a mechanical piece of equipment uh, and eventually it just doesn't work that well. And then duckweed can have pathogens and heavy metals as part of it. So if you do get that, it makes it limits the amount of uses you have for the resulting duckweed. So it was a dream at one point, I think, to, to try and use this sort of mother nature to help us with nutrient removal. But in the end, it's not something that's super practical. Now, personally, I think that, you know, duckweed is more our friend than our foe when it comes to lagoon systems. Uh, there are downsides, but um, you know, uh, as long as you're not pulling duckweed out of your effluent pipe and you're drawing from underneath the duckweed mat, you can get pretty clean water. It really acts as a natural cover to the lagoon and it prevents algae from growing, just like any other cover would. Um, and so I've seen some ponds and, you know, in low lying areas that have really nice covering of duckweed where, you know, they have beautiful water coming out. It looks like glacial water. It's so clean, right? Because there's no algae in it because the duckweed's crowding out all the algae and it allows the solids to settle within a polishing lagoon before it goes out. Um, so it can be really, really good. The thing with duckweed is if you can overcome the nutrient sink problem, uh, then I think it becomes a, a better solution. So this is a, a skimmer that I saw online that I thought was really interesting. Uh, it kind of works like a... Um, it kind of works like a, uh, like almost like a, a, a scum skimmer within a clarifier where it sucks water into it and then it pours it over the water over 
into this, this uh, screen and then the duckweed stays on the top of the screen and the water flows through the screen. And you can have that kind of dump into a uh, trash can or whatever you want. Um, so if you could sustainably harvest the duckweed or sustainably keep the duckweed under control, then I think duckweed can be a, you know, more of a friend than a foe from a nuisance standpoint. Um, but, you know, beyond that, the only other issue I find with duckweed is that it really, um, it, uh, what's the other issue with duckweed? So, um, it's not consistently growing one place. And if you do get wind, it'll blow to one side of the lagoon. And, and so that could be a bit challenging. You can take on chemical solutions to duckweed, just like you can take on chemical solutions to algae, similar results and similar problems. You can also use grass carp to eat duckweed. So this is similar to um, the mish life solution Grass carp will swim around the lagoon. They'll eat all the duckweed. Uh, they'll then poop a lot, uh, uh, and that poop will sink to the bottom, contribute to the sludge blanket, and eventually that grass carp will die. Uh, back in the day when I first started at Triple Point, I had to, on a few occasions, go out to a customer site and help them clean up a bunch of dead grass carp. And, I mean, it was pretty nasty having to uh, pull uh, – dead, decaying fish uh, out of the water, put it in trash bags and throw it away. So not recommended. Uh, I don't really like using fish in lagoons, like I said before, but it's certainly something that can and has been done. Finally, you know, with duckweed, you can aerate. Um, we did that at the one facility where they had kind of a low lying lagoon with a lot of duckweed on it. We put an aerator in there. Uh, and it really kind of just helped to, you know, creates a little bit of turbulence mixing at the surface. It prevents the duckweed from over accumulating. It helps to break down some of the nutrients that are in the water to a degree and um, can, can kind of be helpful to kind of just control the duckweed in a very passive fashion. Um, and so um, it's not going to eliminate the duckweed, but it can help it control it a little bit more so that it's not as much of a nuisance. And typically, you know, duckweed is, you know, again, I think with any kind of aquatic plant, it's it's typically feeding off the nutrient that's in the water. So if you've got lots of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, it's going to use that nitrogen and phosphorus to proliferate within the lagoon. And so you often want to look back and say, okay, what, how much sludge do we have in this lagoon if we're getting a lot of duckweed growth? Is there anything we can do to kind of manage the sludge a little bit better or plan for sludge removal? Um, so just things to think about in terms of solution. So that's it. That's all I had planned for today. I'll have a moment here to do Q&A. Um, all of these webinars end up on our Lake University uh, online platform. You can go on there, get CU and PDH credits. Um, and anytime you want. And so uh, we really try to build this to be helpful and to be a resource to people. I really encourage you to go take a look at it. Um, also, we will have a survey at the end of this presentation. If you could please complete the survey, it helps give us feedback on how we're doing, a doing these presentations and any other topics we might be looking for going forward or any other questions you have. So with that, uh, we'll do a little bit of Q&A. Hey, Patrick, I'm going to start off with a couple comments. Uh, one is we have used swan decoys for pond work to keep geese away. Oh, wow. Yeah, swans was on the list there. But um, a decoy, a fake decoy. swan. Oh, a fake swan. Okay, that's awesome. I never tried that, but I never heard of somebody trying that. But that's great to know that, that people, uh, that that works. Um, here's another. Uh, harassing geese is great until you have a lab tech familiar with federal code reflecting a federal violation for harassment of Canada geese or possibly <laughs> nesting geese. So we Ret don't recommend retracting, retracting my <laughs> statement to harass the geese. Yeah. Don't get in trouble with the feds. Okay. Um, here's the first question. Um, salamanders are a real problem here. That's in Idaho. Uh, especially when they get into the chlorine contact chamber. Any advice? I haven't. I haven't heard of that one. I apologize. We'll look into it. 
Um, so uh, can you clarify you're against using fish such as carp or koi? Yeah, so I don't know that koi fish would survive in a lagoon, but but I've certainly seen grass carp and other types of fish. Um, it, it, you know, the benefits are that, you know, people say that they kind of can stir up the bottom of the uh, of the lagoon a little bit, and which creates some mixing, which can help reduce sludge a little bit. Um, the downside is they do eat the, the algae, and, you know, again, if you get a, the gambusa fish, they'll eat, um, you know, we'll eat the midge flies on the surface and any mosquitoes that are around. But all they're doing is just consuming that stuff, turning it into their excrement, and then that's now sinking down to the bottom and remaining in the lagoon. So I found, you know, I don't know that, you know, a lot of the lagoons that use fish, I found like you look at them, they just look, the water clarity is really not great. It just looks like black death when you look at the water, which I think is a result of a lot of this this uh, this fish poop, they eventually get, these fish can get very big um, and eventually the fish can die. And in some cases they, you can get kind of a mass die off of these fish. Uh, let's say if you have pond turnover in the spring and you get a day or, or 24 hour period where we got really low DO. So that's that's a concern. Um, and if they die, they go belly up, it's, it's a pain in the butt to remove them. So. I'm not as big of a fan of fish. I think, I mean, it's not the end of the world if you, you want to use them. They can be an art, elegant solution. I just think there's some downsides to it that you need to think about. Um, a couple of comments to add to that. Um, koi will not survive in a lagoon. Um, right. Make sure that if you do add grass carp that they're sterile. Uh, someone has learned that the hard way. Um, and also, uh, in Ontario, grass carp are not allowed, so you need to check your state and local regulations and make sure they're not banned. Cool. Um, have you dealt with turtles in lagoons or storage ponds? Um, we found snapping turtles in a lagoon recently and didn't want to go near it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're turtles. They can also build up in those downstream structures sometimes, and a lot of times what they can also do is um, they'll get stuck in the effluent pipe between one lagoon and another, um, and it's not so easy. And they'll, they'll get stuck in there, and then they'll die. And then you got this big shell in there that you got to somehow get in and, and unclog. Um, so a lot of times, the ideal thing to do there, they're not really a problem in the lagoon itself, but a lot of facilities put like a turtle screen, what they call a turtle screen, um, on the end of the pipe that's in the lagoon itself, which is a really you know, quite a big, not not a not a tight mesh screen or anything like that. It's basically just a couple of bars that go across the pipe, or two or three bars enough to kind of leave some maybe two inch gaps, but nothing much more in order to prevent turtles from getting stuck in there and getting stuck in the pipe because they're a pain to remove. So that's really what I've seen people do. But yeah, they can be they can they can be a decent decent thing. I don't know that they're that much of a nuisance in my experience. Um, here's another comment, and thank you for adding to the discussion. Um, turtles will lay their eggs outside the pond or lagoon. Never pick them up by a turtle trap. Okay. Um, we have small frogs in our finishing ponds. Is it a problem? Nope. I don't think frogs are an issue. No. Uh, what about ultrasonic transmitters for algae control? Um, I, you know, when they first came out, uh, I think the, what I saw of those is that they would work initially for algae control, uh, primarily within more stormwater ponds than wastewater ponds. I don't have as much experience with wastewater ponds using algae, uh, ultrasonic, but then what would happen is that the algae, you know, certain types of algae that would be affected by the ultrasonic signal would die off and then other types of algae would grow in their place that aren't as affected by the ultrasonic signal. And so that was the initial take on it. So it would work for a while and then stop working. These days, there are companies that have fancy ultrasonic units that vary the type of signal and some that are even cooler than that, that really uh, vary the type of signal and are taking measurements of uh, chlorophyll in real time in order to adjust the signal based on that. Um, and so I, 
I've seen those technologies. I've always wanted to test that kind of technology on a lagoon system because often those technologies are developed for drinking water reservoirs or, you know, like I said, stormwater ponds, and they're not used in a wastewater lagoon, which is a little different, uh, especially when you consider that a wastewater lagoon, I mean, it has nutrients flowing into it every single day, right? That's coming from the collection system. So it's a more torbid environment, it's a more nutrient rich environment, et cetera. So it's a much tougher environment than a drinking water reservoir to control algae in. Um, and so I, I, I was always wanted to try it. I've never had it, I never personally tried it. We haven't tried it as a company, but um, you know, uh, it could work, it could not work. I'm not entirely sure uh, with the more modern ones, but I think like some of the basic ones at the beginning, one transmitter, one signal, I don't, I really don't have much faith that that'll work uh, over the long run in the lagoon. Any suggestions for gophers, moles, and voles digging into dikes? Gophers. Um, I think it's similar to muskrats. Um, I think, again, it's, you know, riprap is going to prevent that from happening. All the similar recommendations, if you can deter them from getting into the berms or, or hang, you know, trying to get into the berms, that can be the best way to kind of deal with them. Uh, other than that, I don't have any specific recommendations. Any experience with barley straw for algae? Um, so I've seen this work pretty well. Um, when we do our algae webinar uh, coming up, maybe in the spring or in the summer, um, we'll dive into it in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, I think some of the issues I see potentially with barley straw, I think it can work well. I don't have any negative, overall negative uh, impression of it. It does break down over time and that barley straw itself will become biomass in your lagoon. Once it does break down and sinks to the bottom, it'll be part of your sludge blanket and it'll be something that needs to be broken down. But it can be a useful tool from what I've seen. It can be effective at, uh, at limiting uh, algae buildup. Um, a couple questions about safe chemicals to remove duckweed. Um, so I'm not familiar specifically with the chemicals that they have offhand. It's been a while since I've looked at that. Uh, one of the places you can look at is Aquafix. Um, they're a company that we've worked with in the past and they're usually my go-to whenever I want something like this say, okay, what chemical would you use to kind of control duckweed? So if you go to teamaquafix.com, they'll be able to give you better answers. Anybody have alligators in their lagoon? I've heard of alligators. Um, yeah, so in Louisiana, we've done a bunch of work down in Louisiana. And yeah, you'll see it. You'll see them floating around out there. I think that, that one pond, um, I'll show you this one. This is in Louisiana, and um, it's uh, it definitely has some alligators in the lagoon. I've heard, so it's kind of fun. Don't go near it. <laughs> uh, one more. Uh, seems that the answer to most of the critter problems is mixing agitation. Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you know mixing is just a great thing for wastewater lagoons. Um, and if you can agitate the top of the water and mix it, and you know, anytime you can add air, it's going to be beneficial to the overall treatment process. It's going to prevent some of the not so good things from happening. So I think that definitely helps. I don't think it's like if if you are talking about an odor issue with your lagoon, I would say aeration is pretty slam dunk at solving that problem, um, assuming you put enough aeration in there to do it. If you're talking about critter or algae or anything else like that, aeration mixing is going to help, certainly not going to be a cure-all. Um, so I never tell anybody, and I've made this mistake where I've been a little bit too positive on aeration solving an algae problem in and up by itself, and then people come back and they're like, well, it didn't solve my problem. I'm like, well, I didn't say it would solve your problem. I said it would help, you know, and, and so I think um, you got to be a little bit careful with that when it comes to algae. Uh, aeration will help. But ultimately, the problem is a little bit more difficult than that when it comes to algae. But overall, aeration, mixing, anything like that is really something that's super helpful for critters, for sure.
I think that's all the time for questions. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming. This is my reference list here. Uh, if you want to check any of these things out, we will be sending out again a survey at the end of this. Please complete the survey. If you're looking for CE or PDH credit, uh, Eve will be getting back to you with those certificates and that information. Thank you so much for coming today. Have a wonderful rest of your week and holidays.